Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of the DDL show. I am so excited that we're going to be talking about a topic that used to be exciting and has stopped being exciting, and that itself is exciting. So I'm super excited to bring on uh, Darren Hacken. Uh, I think our first conversation, Darren, was literally on the Data Mesh Learning Group, first time we met. Um, and so it's it's kind of a full circle. I'm super excited to welcome you to the show. Darren is an engineering director heading up uh, platform and data at AutoTrader. And I'm your host, Shushanka, co-founder and CTO at uh, Acryl and founder of the Data Hub project. So Darren, tell us uh, about yourself and how you got into data. Hi, Shushanka. Thank you for having me today. Um, yeah, so my name's Darren, I work for a company in the UK and the United Kingdom called AutoTrader. So we're a automotive marketplace and technology platform that drives, it's the UK's largest um, automotive platform. So buying and selling cars, that kind of thing. And one of the areas that I deeply, deeply care about is, is the data space. Um, so here at AutoTrader, I kind of look after our kind of data platform, um, the capabilities that we need in order to surface data been working in data a long time now, maybe eight, nine years. Um, I, my, I, funny story, I vowed I would never work in data because when I started my career, I worked in FinTech for, in a, in a data team. And I absolutely hated it because it was all GUI based ETL tools. And I got out of it as fast as I possibly could and said, never again. I love engineering. I, you know, I'm a coder. I need to get away and do this other thing. You also, don't like pointing and clicking, clearly. I didn't like pointing and clicking. I like I liked code. Um, and then it kind of got really sexy and big data and technology changed. And I think it's one of the most exciting areas of, of technology now. So never say never is probably my, I always find that a funny kind of starting point for me in terms of data to leave a, to leave a role and go never again. And here I am. Um, so yeah, passionate about data really think it's one of them things that really can shape and change organizations. It's, um, and it's, it's, it's growing all the time, right? With things like AI and LMs and hype cycles around things like that. But yeah, thanks for having so me. They, they do say data has gravity and, you know, uh, normally it's like pulling other data close to it, but uh, clearly people also get attracted to it and can never leave. I was literally the same way. Uh, well, I never went to data and I wasn't able to leave. So I was, um, you know, an engineer on the um, online data infrastructure teams, right? So I was uh, doing uh, display ads and uh, doing real time bidding uh, on ads uh, at Yahoo. And then I uh, was offered the uh, chance of a lifetime to go rebuild LinkedIn's data infrastructure. And I didn't actually know what data meant at that point. I was scared of databases, honestly, because you know it's hard to build something that's supposed to be a source of truth. Like, wait, you're responsible for actually making sure the write actually made it to disk and it actually got flushed and was replicated three times so that no one loses an update. Well, that seems like a hard problem. So, you know, that was my mission impossible that I went to LinkedIn for, and I never left. I've just been in data this whole time. So can totally relate. <laughs> You never escape the gravity. You do not. Um, <clears throat> so, well, so you're you're leading big uh, teams at uh, AutoTrader right now. You know, platform and data. Tell me a little bit about what that team does, because you know, as I have talked to so many data leaders <clears throat> around the world, it seems clear to me that all data teams are similar, but not all teams are exactly the same. So maybe walk our audience through what does the data team do and who are the surrounding teams and how do they interact with them? Yeah. Um, so we, so interestingly, AutoTrader as an organization has been around for about 40 years. So they started as a magazine. You could go into your you know, local store and find the magazine and pick it up. So that's interestingly means that as technologies evolve throughout the decades, you know, they've gone through many chapters of, of it. Um, but today we're, we're relatively decentralized in terms of our data team setup. And, you know, we'll get into that, I guess, a little bit more when we talk about data mesh today. Um, but we have a kind of platform team. So we have several platform teams and we have our platform team. 
um, predominantly built, made up of engineers and kind of SRE types, DevOps, you know, folks. And they build um, what we call our data platform. And that is the kind of product name, I guess, for the bundling of technology, which would, would help drive data capabilities across the organization. You know, that might be building data products, which we can get into later. It could be um, metadata management, how to create security policies with data. Um, mm -hmm. But crucially, their play is about building capabilities that let other people um, use these capabilities and, and build technology. And other than that, we try to keep data teams closer to um, the domain of, of, a, of an area or a problem. So we may have data teams. We focus a lot on like ad advertising or user behavior, maybe more around like vehicles and pricing and fulfillment type problems. Um, but we, we tend to have kind of data engineers or engineers that specialize in data, um, scientists and analysts. So they're, they're kind of as a discipline together and managed together from a craft perspective, but then in terms of how, how they work together, we tend to form, form them around problems, um, pricing, as I said earlier, and things like that. And they would maybe do analytics, self-serve analytics, um, product analytics, machine learning, um, you know, feature engineering, very much that kind of thing. And we try to keep it as close to kind of engineering as, as possible. So very much a, a decentralized play, or that's been our current, our current generation of people wearing team topologies. Um, got it, right got now. it. And by the way, for the yeah. audience who's li listening in, um, definitely uh, feel free to ask questions. We'll, we'll try to pull them up uh, as they come in. So, you know, this is meant to be me talking to Darren and Darren talking to me and all of you being uh, having the ability to kind of participate in the conversation. So um, definitely, uh, as we keep talking about this topic, uh, keep asking questions and we'll try to pull them up and um, combine them. So Darren, you talked a little bit about how the teams were structured. It definitely resonated with kind of how uh, LinkedIn evolved over the uh, over the years I was there. We started out uh, with uh, a single data team that was uh, responsible for both platform as well as uh, business. So, you know, they were responsible for making decisions like what warehousing technology to use and how to go about it. And then, but also building the executive dashboard and building the foundational data sets. We had so many debates about whether to call them foundational or gold, but the concept was still the same. You build kind of the, the, the canonical business model on top of which you want all um, insights as well as you know analytics as well as AI to be derived from. And then over the years, we definitely had a lot of stress with that centralization and had to kind of split apart the responsibilities. Uh, we ended up going to a model where there was essentially a data unaware or semantics unaware team that was fully responsible just for the platform and um, sub teams that emerged out of those, uh, out of that original team that sometimes got fully embedded into product delivery teams to actually uh, essentially have a local loop where product gets built, data comes out of it, and then the whole loop of creating insights, models, and features, and then shipping it back into the product was all owned and operated by um, a specific team. So it looks like that's kind of where you've ended up as well. Yeah, in fact, that's spookily similar. I mean, we started definitely more centralized and then these teams sort of came out of that more centralized model. So like we, we built a team about user behavior and advertising, kind of built that, that went really well. And then they felt a lot more connected and it, it did evolve like that. Um, and, and a lot of this, I think, just spawns from scale, really. So. I mean, uh, my organization is definitely not as big as where, where you were previously working, Shashanka, but we, we definitely find that, you know, the more hungry an organization gets for data, eventually you, you simply can't keep up with this centralized team with this scarcity of resource and everyone fighting over the same thing. It gets really hard to think about, you know, do I invest in the finance team? Do I uh, invest in our advertising or our marketing team? So like, eventually like partitioning almost your resource in some way feels inevitable that you have to, to otherwise it becomes, yeah. it becomes so hard. Cool. So let's, let's, let's talk about the topic of the, the day. Yeah. What does data mesh mean to you then? 
now that we've kind of understood how the teams have evolved and what your uh, teams are doing day to day? Yeah, and I think it's a really good point that we started around teams and culture, actually, because that is really what I think the heart of what Jaya Mesh is. Um, so I, I, I used to work um, for ThoughtWorks where Jamak, who also kind of came up with the, the data mesh thing, um, kind of came from. And I, I wasn't working at the time, but I remember reading it. And we have were already on this journey of like, we need to decentralize and our platform was really important to us and we, we need capabilities and we want more people to do that. And in fact, you know, we, we were succeeding at decentralizing and scaling. Um, but I think when we did that, we were entering new spaces where a lot of people hadn't really talked about it. So for me, data mesh, one of the things that it means, it, it, it's a you know socio-technical thing, a cultural thing. It's like DevOps really or something like that for me. She's done a great sure. job of describing how to, um, you, you know, did get there like data products and all this kind of thing but one of the great things i think that jamak did with talking about data mesh was built a lexicon a grammar a way of us all communicating to each other like shashanka me and you met on a on a data mesh you know community yeah. and immediately we, we we were able to speak at a level that we simply wouldn't have been able to maybe if we would have met five years ago and try to have the same conversation um so a lot of it's that for me that's what data mesh is it's about it's a, it's a method or an architectural pattern or set of principles or guidelines about how you could achieve decentralization and, and move away from this, this central team and, and kind of break apart from it. Um, and that has, been, yeah, and that yeah, has yeah. been the big draw, right, to, of, of the concepts because a lot of people relate to it uh, and kind of resonate with it. And then that from that, um, what is it, summit of hope, comes the the valley of despair where you you start figuring out okay how do i translate this idea into reality and how much do i need to change um so walk us through your journey of like how have you implemented data mesh how have you taken these principles and brought them to life or at least attempted to bring them to life and we'll see how you feel about it like would you give yourself an a grade or a b grade we'll we'll, we'll figure that out later but what have you done in, in sure. bringing that um, to life. Yeah. So, so at the point when we started trying to apply data mesh, um, we were in this place where we, we decentralized some of our teams, but our technology underneath is still very much centralized and shared. So almost like a monolith with teams contributing to it, but everything was partitioned or structured around technology. So we'd end up with, I don't know, a DBT project or something, right? Or we had a monolith around spark jobs and things so it's very technology partitioned um and then when we started looking at data mesh we were really excited because one of the big things that we took out of it was this term data product and we're like great we've now found this 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 language to describe how we were going to try and break things down like before that we were trying to break break you know lots of data down into chunks of data but we just couldn't think of like the, the wording gave us a lot more power to, to start communicating. So we, we started trying to break down our DBT monolith essentially into data products. Um, and that's been one of our journeys of like breaking it, partitioning it and, and, and doing that. So that was the big starting point of doing that. Um, so it was very much like we had some teams that were decentralized and then like how do we almost catch the technology up? So DBT was the starting point of that. So you went from a, a monolithic repo where all of your transformation logic was being hosted to chopping it up and um, splitting it up uh, across multiple different teams. Um, great. So once you did that, what did you then find? Well, then you find that the tooling and ecosystem that we've got today has some gaps when you start to think about decentralization like a lot of the technologies that we use in the data space do promote very much very centralized centralized approach um like i think it's becoming a little bit less popular but you know airflow if you like one airflow for your whole organization dbt might say one big project even though they are saying that less now but there was definitely a period where like you know that was the that was the popular approach so we you break things apart and now you've got gaps between data products 
where you've got DBT and DBT, and now you've got gaps. And that's where you really start to realize that there are other requirements that start to come in that you need. And two big ones that felt obvious for us were around data governance, metadata, kind of knowing more about these data products at, at, a, meta, at a meta level, observability, and how you define that, and also how you create, start creating security policies between them. So it's the classic thing of when organizations move to microservices, like all of a sudden, like monitoring between things, things breaking in, you know, in the infrastructure level between the, net, the network protocol starts to happen. I think the data world is not there and is catching up and I think it will one day, but today they were some of the gaps that we started to see. Um, so like by breaking down, I'll give you an example. So like by breaking down DVTs, so you have this monolith with maybe, I don't know, 50 people working on an area of a monolith. I mean, you break that down into data products. You then start to realize, well, we didn't really have clear ownership with that. Like who owned it? Like people were contributing together as maintainers maybe, but who owns, who owns this data asset? Who actually, who is the team that do it? And that's where we started to realize, well, you need kind of metadata over the top to start labeling things like that. Or we also had this other symptom coming out where because we had all of our code in one place, it was very easy for like team A and team B to use data between each other and not really realize and start creating dependencies. So then we were almost trying to start using metadata to say, well, who should be allowed to use my data product? And you know, that, that stuff starts to get teased out. So cross cross team discoverability, cross team lineage and visibility and some sort of understandability and governance and observability across uh, started to become an important need for you. Yeah, exactly. Like if you're an analyst or a scientist, when it was all in one monolith, they essentially just open the browse, expand and try to find data they were looking for. And then when we break things out more into data products and you've not got that kind of ability, we started to see people kind of move into Slack and looking for tribal knowledge and being like, hey, does anyone know where I can find this data product? I used to see it in the monolith somewhere. Where is it now? Who owns it? And things like that. So this is where like discoverability um, lineage became even more critical. Who was the owner? Should this person change this code or should it be only the owner? That kind of thing. And these were really positive things for us actually. But when it was one monolith, we just couldn't, we couldn't really see that we were kind of missing some of these quality components, I guess, to, to data management. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what did you end up uh, using for that, uh, to solve that problem? Um, so initially, um, we started really simple. And what we did is we, we used, um, there's like a meta block in DBT. And we started to define metadata at that level. And then we started building kind of CLIs or tooling around it in our, in our build processes to grab that metadata and, and make decisions. And that sort of gave us the confidence, the confirmation, right? That this hypothesis we had that metadata was going to like a, a metadata aware environment was going to help drive a lot of automation, a lot of um, data management decisions, right? Through systems, not through humans. Uh, and then we ended up um, moving to uh, to Data Hub to Acrol and and using that as the the product to start collecting uh, metadata and and like building this kind of connections between data products and treating that as a first class citizen. Now you started the conversation talking about not liking point and click experiences and not liking you know being in the UI too much if you could avoid it. So how have you tried to apply those same principles in how you've implemented data mesh? Like are your data owners and data producers and consumers kind of going into Acryl and typing out a ton of documentation or annotating data sets or like how, how are they bridging these two worlds between, you know, the, the product experience and, you know, the, the DBT meta YAML, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I wish, I wish we'd fully solve this. I mean, our preference is always to try and do as much inversion control as possible. Um, so like one of the big initial challenges we had that has made this journey feel frankly quite slow. It, there's no there's no tooling that exists to create a data product that I'm aware of, or if it is, it's, it's, it's hot off the press. 
So um, we're heavy users of Kubernetes. That's how we manage a lot of our services. Um, and for those on today that don't know much about Kubernetes, one of the great things that it has is, is almost like a resource manifest or it's got a database underneath it where if I want to create a resource in the cloud, I can create this resource and it is like a, a YAML definition and I can, I can do that. So what we started to do was define definitions for data products, create them as resources and store them in, in Kubernetes. Um, and Kubernetes is very nice because it also has like events. So it can send events when new resources are created and when they're updated and all that kind of thing. So we've gone to this place where we've provisioned data products and then we've automated creating them. So again, that's very, um, kind of data products as code, I guess. And we right. try to do the same for as much as we can with tools like metadata systems and, and other things. Um, and that's mostly to have that governance of, of the metadata. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like the meta to, to be active with the metadata and to automate things with it. We need so you essentially it. use Kubernetes as your control plane yeah. for, for data. And anytime any changes happen, you've got your operators kind of publishing metadata as events that comes into Acryl, and that's why everything stays fresh and live. I think uh, that's yeah. that's essentially how you've implemented it. So and then yeah, we use data yeah. as like like a broader view. So like you've almost got like the infrastructure view in Kubernetes, and then the data product view is almost um, wrapped around that, and we, we use Data Hub for that to kind of fully yep. complete the picture. So if I'm a product manager or somebody like that, they would gravitate more towards the view in, in Data Hub. My data platform team probably gravitate more into the kind of QED as well because they're looking at, you know, like BigQuery provisioning, Snowflake provisioning, um, object storage, service con service accounts, that kind of thing. Right, right. So you fully embraced kind of this shift left philosophy of defining data, metadata, all of these things as code, checking them in, versioning them and i guess you're waiting for the promised land where this and the product experience kind of bi-directionally work with each other and are able to you know stay in sync and, and you know you can kind of live between the two worlds uh, without losing uh context yeah and i think i think that's one of the big challenges with data mesh today is just I guess it's like the, the cost still is very high to, mm -hmm. to apply these principles. Um, but you don't need to apply them all in one go. Like, I, I mean, we've been kind of progressing towards this as a, as a kind of journey, uh, but I, I really still hope that we will start to see more emerging technology. Um, it's just really hard because like, as I kind of said, before we moved into a data mesh world, every technology almost is very, they own one piece of the stack. So you have a, one company that just own scheduling airflow, one company that own transformation, for example. And it's really hard because you kind of need to pivot that round and have somebody just say, we'll let you define data products and they're gonna span multiple technologies. That's a hard problem, but it, it doesn't feel unsolvable. I mean, we, we did it right internally. Um, other companies are doing this, it, it must be possible. Um, and, and even, I, I mean, I feel promised today that things like data hub exist and we have far better observability tools. Yep. Like five years ago, I, I, we, we didn't have any observability tools really that were right. even remotely close to anything you could get in terms of monitoring a microservice. It, it just didn't exist. Yep. So I, I feel hopeful, but it's, you know, it's a journey we all have to kind of, we go on together. Definitely a journey. I mean, we started out with, um, you know, Data Hub, the project started out first with saying, let's just bring visibility, let there be light, <laughs> I guess, is how we started out with, like, let's actually shine a light on all the corners of your data stack. And to, you know, right now, we're just talking DBT, right? But in general, we talk DBT and upstream and further upstream. In fact, when we look at our telemetry, and we look at what are the things that people are connecting Data Hub up to, guess what is the number one source that people connected to? Postgres. So Postgres is still winning and is still dominant because a lot of data lives on Postgres. And so, you know, that width and breadth is kind of the central piece that we went after making sure visibility was kind of prioritized. And now we're starting to see stories where people are using it for definitional data, 
uh, checkout.com, for example, has done data products and they define them and register them on Data Hub. And on the back of the chain stream, once you have a data product registered, they're starting to provision stuff in the back. Like they're starting to provide access or even set up those tables. So I think we're starting to see that next step that you were alluding to happen uh, even in our community. So we've talked a lot about kind of things you did, the technologies you used. Let's talk about the things that didn't work, uh, the things you haven't yet implemented. So I think one of the hardest things that's come from Data Mesh um, is the architectural strain that it can like it can put on an organization. So like we've we decentralized and now we have like data teams focused on domains and other things and that goes well but it also is much harder to encode at a platform level what good looks like for some for architecture around software and even more so for um for data products like what do you name a data product like people people with tech when, when people did data warehousing and they had a you know facts and dimensions there are books and books and books telling you recommended practices about how to name tables based on certain characteristics of the table. I am yet to find like the, you know, like if I think about my background in building APIs, you'd have like different design patterns for them and all that. Like we're still, we're still lacking that. So we spend a lot of time trying to think about like, what do we call this? Is it performance data? Is it metrics? Is it like, what are these words that we should use? But then also generating encode um, design patterns in them, because when you've got smaller units of data, like the design patterns that you would create for them is kind of different if it was one humongous thing that you want to apply um, these to. So that's been really difficult. And then I think not having that centralized team, it, it, it's much harder to keep the sort of the quality of the the practice is high when it's decentralized. It just takes a lot of work in a way um, that you wouldn't need in a centralized team. And we also see this other scenario where if like if a data team's closest to the product team and they're also very skilled at engineering, you know, they might say, oh, well, maybe we could stop doing that data work and they could do some more product work, for example. So you get like stresses like that where you know you kind of decentralize and generalize more. And that tension now is sometimes you want specialized and you want to hold on to that. And then there's, there's just that, like, to think that challenge that as a, as a data leader, you wouldn't have had when you just have a box and say, that's, that's your centralized data team, like it's, it's allocated. So that's definitely one of the, the challenges that we've, we've come under and quality is a big part of that. Like, how do you, how do you kind of work out if this data product is of a higher quality than another one? Um, we're starting to make a lot of progress with that with, with metadata again, where we're starting to kind of label, you know, heuristics like number of incidents, owners, and building up kind of a almost a like a metadata of, quality framework. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's hard. Uh, I think it's, uh, I mean, don't beat yourself up too much. Naming is hard. I think it's one of the two problems that are hard about computer science. So. I think it'll continue to be a, a challenge. Wait till you get to caching data products and then that'll be uh, the next hard problem. <clears throat> but data modeling, completely agree. Um, in fact, even at LinkedIn, you know, where we, like I said, went through this journey of going from centralized to trying to decentralize. <clears throat> and we faced it in the microservices world very quickly. Uh, we started realizing data modeling practices started uh, fracturing and um, the initial reaction was really get control back. And the, the first thing we did was formed a data model review committee. And for you know any LinkedIn alumni or you know existing LinkedIn employees, if you're you know tuned in, you might kind of start to shudder and jitter because you know DMRC or data model review committee was was a very uh, traumatic experience for the whole company. It was it was great for centralized control but resulted in a lot of delays um, as, as products went to production because um, halfway through you know, shipping a product, you would certainly get caught and, and get told that you have to go back and redesign your, your schema or your, um, your, your data model. And so you know, that team spent kind of a year or two asserting control and then the next year or two trying to tool themselves out of existence. 
And so <clears throat> I think we'll, we'll see that kind of pattern emerge in, in real world deployments as well, where we'll see these central teams kind of have those uh, anxiety attacks when they start decentralizing, try to assert control through gatekeeping, but then realize gatekeeping doesn't work. And so you have to kind of tool yourself out of existence by just finding a way to declare what good looks like, finding a way to describe what that good looks like in a programmatic way, and then provide it to a platform that can then make that thing happen. So I think still for me, in my opinion, something that uh, you know some folks like us are doing a little bit of that in our product, but I think the future uh, is, is kind of being able to auto describe what good looks like and then uh, being able to stand, standardize those practices without needing uh, too much human gatekeeping to happen. Um, would love to pull up uh, one of the questions from the audience at this point before we uh, drop into kind of uh, chatting about the future. Um, you know, we have a question from the audience around like, are you using data contracts? If you are, um, we've talked a lot about data products. Um, and thankfully, we didn't talk about what a data product is because that would be a whole different hour conversation. But let's uh, let's move and talk about data contracts. If, are you using them? How is the contract structured? Are you using a standard template or something else? Yeah. So this feels like we what the way. Um, so we we kind of try to left shift a lot of contracts or like rigor around this stuff. So like for example, we had a real big push that if we were going to ingest. Um, data into the analytical plane into our, our data platform, we would expect that everything was using Avro schemas and using Kafka. Therefore, like you're kind of shifting responsibility back to a producer team. They need to, you know, make sure there is a really good contract there. And we have got to this place where we've got versioning and, and really good things like that and, and, and checks. Um, so we have that, but between data products, this is definitely one of the areas that I'm very, very interested in is, just, is like we've been doing data contracts probably more implicitly. So we have a bunch of standardized um, like metadata tests and, and validators, um, and we, we try to detect things um, in a very automated way around detecting schema changes and then kind of triggering that for somebody to look into. But I'm very much interested in, in, in where the industry is moving now, where we're thinking about data contracts. Um, I, I find this the fun space quite surprising because everyone's talking about it or was, but it was very revolutionary, not evolutionary. And as a, as a, as a technologist, as an engineer, these feel like, yeah, like this, this is a very much a, an, an obvious thing that I would do if I was building an API, for example, I would expect a, a contract and a, and a schema in place. But as, as in most instances, the, the data world is always a bit nascent to, to some of these practices. Um, but it, it seems really positive and it's, it's worked in a lot of other software engineering domains. I think there's definitely a bunch of uh, so so. Thanks for for that um, uh, response. I think there's definitely uh, a lot of sociological processes that happen in the data world where we get attracted to a new concept, a new term. We all rally around it. Uh, we try to make that a reality. And then, you know, in a couple of years, disillusionment starts setting in because hard problems continue to stay hard. And then um, often a new term emerges. And then we all rally around that. Um, the, the hard problems, I think, around data quality, data governance, metadata management, they have continued to stay hard and challenging. Um, and I think at different points in the evolution of the data industry, we've kind of picked up different phrases as the rallying cry to go and do something about it. So I, I, in fact, I think about data mesh as an example of something like that. I think about data contracts as something similar to that. So, you know, Gartner, I think earlier this week or maybe last week uh, published an update saying data mesh is now dead or it's about to disappear. We're not, not no longer tracking it or something like that. So what is your advice for others that are thinking of either starting continuing or abandoning their data mesh strategies? Yeah, I mean, I could have a, I, it, I can't tell if this is just, you know, a marketing cycle around 
you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm expecting the article that data mesh is dead, long live data mesh next, and you know, the classic tropes. I mean, it, I, think, I think Ryan Dolly actually did uh, a quick right. video okay, about done. it last week or this week. Yeah. So it's, right. it's, uh, I think modern data stack is dead. So that's the new marketing cycle. And then the data the mesh is, is, is either dead or about to be dead. So that's the other, the other uh, conversation doing the rounds. But anyways, what do, what do you think? Well, well, I think that throughout all of my career as a technologist, as an engineer, we, we go through organizations have a level of centralization or decentralization around technology period. Um, so, so to me, data mesh was all about this idea that particular organizations don't want to be centralized. It, it becomes too much of a constraint for them to succeed with data, which isn't for everybody. Like I wouldn't recommend, you know, an organization of five people, like a startup should go all in on data mesh. I think it comes with a particular amount of size, right? And need. Um, you, you kind of outgrow the central team, just like most of the technology problems come with scale. So to me, data mesh is all about giving us that language and a set of principles and values about how to succeed at decentralization. Maybe they all aren't right. Maybe some are good and some aren't quite as good, or they can't really quite get there because technology isn't ready today, maybe ready in three years, five years, or maybe it never will. But I, I can't imagine a world where there isn't a reasonable number of size organizations that need to, to be more decentralized of how they work with data. Um, so I kind of don't worry if it wins or dies, I suppose, on some level because of that. The bit which I do really hope succeeds is that the technology gets there and rises to the occasion to make it easier. And I think the biggest reason I'm passionate about that is one of the things that has changed for my organization by doing data mesh is the, the data product thinking, the product thinking over data. Like when we went and built some of our data products, you kind of, um, how to describe this? Like sometimes like data is so fine grained. It's like grains of sand, you know, on the beach and you can't, you can't see like I could build a castle right out of this or anything. So like when we started to like group data and do that and catalog and structure things, you go, actually we could go further here you know um like as an example we, we we get lots of observations about car sales and other things and then we sort of realize when we could see the shape of that that actually we could go further and we could start to bring more like confidence intervals on sales and look ahead and do forecasting and we could always do that the data was there to always do that by having shapes around data products that was the exciting thing so i think if to kind of conclude that I think if it wins or succeeds, I think it's about if any of that lives on, and I think it should for any organization, that's that's the key thing. So if data mesh falls out of popularity, I, I imagine there'll just be another architectural blueprint about how to do decentralization, because I can't, I can't see that going away in every company around the world. So long live data mesh principles. Yeah. Sure, okay, great. Um, so on that note, you know, you've you've got uh, the wind behind your back. You've done um, data as code, metadata as code, shift left. You're you're kind of doing control plane for data from what it seems like with you, you know with Kubernetes as your um, provider layer. What are you excited for uh, about the future? Is it continuing this decentralization game and kind of making self serve data? and then um, high quality data across teams a reality, or is it AI or is it like, what, what does the future look like for your teams? Well, I think everybody is excited about LLMs, aren't they? So isn't that a given? Um, I think for data mesh and data products, I think I'm, uh, although we've made a lot of progress, there's just so much to do, um, like, we run a lot of our operational services, our microservices, our APIs, and our you know operational systems on Kubernetes, and we have applied a lot of these same principles that we're applying to the data world today operationally, and it's it's completely transformed how our organization operates, you know how we deploy services, just how mature we are as a technology business, and I just see such an obvious road to keep going that way with data mesh and. You know, increase our profits, increase our time to market, 
find better and more engaging ways of using our data, um, you know, shorten cycles around how we do an, an ML product and go to market. So that's probably one of the largest areas that excites me with data mesh. It's the possibilities of what we get more out of our data. Where we're seeing this happen a lot today is, is probably now starting to show up in more of our business areas. So like more emphasis on say marketing, more emphasis on um, customer experience, like how we bring data into these spaces more and, and by unbundling from a central team and building data teams and data products around them, we're starting to unlock a lot more things with them than we would have done when we have that, that's, that kind of centralized team with everybody fighting over it. Um, so that's what excites me and, and possibly LLMs, depending on if it's a, a bubble or not, depending on how you, how you view that, I guess. In fact, a couple of episodes ago, I was chatting with uh, Hema, uh, who's uh, heading up uh, Kumo.ai, and um, we were talking about the, the the needs of AI. And you know, guess what? Metadata is one of the biggest things that AI teams need to do a couple of things well. One is reproducibility and understandability and explainability, um, and the second thing is actually prompt engineering and you know, real. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, for rag architectures and stuff like that. So it's actually kind of interesting how the worlds of metadata and AI are also kind of coming together around the same time. With respect to data mesh, I definitely feel like the tooling, like you said, coming together is is kind of a theme. I'm excited even within our existing community and customer base. Uh, we're seeing a lot more um, cases where people our customers are talking about data products. They're actually using data products in the catalog for real, not just asking about it. So we've gone from the stage where people would just be interested because we had data products, like data, data Hub had data products like maybe a year ago at this point. You know, We've gone from seeing people just asking about data products to actually having them and using them and asking more. So you know, data product lineage, input out reports, all of these things that we've promised to the community are actually going to come out this year. I'm really excited to see what uh, folks do with it. Um, and the same thing with data contracts. You know, We've kind of had it in the product for a while, but we're starting to see people really want to connect these two together and to see them uh, stitched together. Last town hall, we had a gentleman, Stefan, uh, from KPN actually talk about you know, a full-on data product spec that he's working on and developing on top of Data Hub. So it's 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 pretty exciting to see, uh, kind of despite the overall hype cycle around the term data mesh kind of going down, definitely seeing a lot of the practical implementations coming to life. And I think what you said about um, you know human comprehension being a hard problem, and so the more and more data we generate and create as industries as companies, the need to simplify and communicate using simpler terminology, simpler, more um, coalesced uh, objects that we can all rally around and govern uh, has definitely been um, uh, an advantage that we've all gained. Uh, a, a relational uh, person would be like, well, that's what schemas in databases are supposed to be. And they're probably right. Uh, but I think in as we've split apart databases and kind of fractured the world into GraphQL schemas and open API schemas and Kafka topics and S3 buckets and a bunch of snowflake tables, I think needing that logical layer on top has kind of definitely uh, come back in. And it's, it is showing promise. And I think the I'm excited for the future of trying to stay polyglot and poly, you know, impl at the lower layers because that's where innovation happens while still staying harmonized and uh, logical uh, at the at the understanding layer. Yeah, I think uh, Data Hub is, uh, metadata systems, but especially Data Hub have the potential to be the control plane that we have to develop. Like, and I think that's really exciting. And I do hope that, I don't know, Apple, the Data Hub community, the open source community realize that and build around it. Like by, by having these materialized in a system, we can build, you know, the ability to make data products and provision them in different cloud environments a lot more trivial than it is today. Um, and I do feel like there will be a point when there'll be enough technology available to do this that you will really see it 
explode. It just needs that that moment. But more people are doing it than it's probably you probably realize like the uh, and and the bit that I think will live with without with or without data mesh is data products. This this idea of encapsulating some of your data and describing it as a as a system. I feel like that is a really powerful tool um, to come out of, of data mesh as a, as a vocabulary, as a concept, as a way of us you know building systems from in, in a more decentralized way than a star schema, for example. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, Darren, and it's uh, it's been such a great chat. I almost didn't uh, keep track of time. We went uh, a good fifteen minutes over, but hopefully yeah. the audience had a had a good time uh, listening. And uh, thanks for your questions. Uh, we'll we'll see you on the internet, as they say. Uh, and um, you know, it's been it's been a pleasure talking to you, Darren, and it's been a pleasure collaborating with you over the years as well. So, looking forward to uh, building great things together. Thanks for having me, Shankar, and thanks to everybody that joined and listened and the questions that we got. Thank you very much.